Carl Dix, welcome to Cindy Sheehan Soapbox. Thank you for having me on, Cindy. Well, thank you. Um, thank you for being in Ferguson to, to bear witness and to help the struggle there. Uh, but tell myself and my listeners what you're doing in Ferguson, Ferguson, Missouri. Why did you go there? Well, I went there because Michael Brown was murdered by the police. Mm -hmm. But even more importantly, because usually when an 18-year-old black man gets murdered by the police, it gets swept under the rug and covered up. But this time, they were unable to do that. People in Ferguson poured into the streets, demanding justice, protesting night after night after night. The police mobilized. They came at them with militarized weapons, armored personnel carriers, <clears throat> fired tear gas, rubber bullets, used sound cannons. Right. And they couldn't stop people from taking to the street. And it began to hit me, this is different. This time, people are refusing to accept it. And if this could develop and be strengthened, it could reach to people all around the country who are dealing with the same problem of police terror, police brutality, and all the abuses from the criminal injustice system of this country. So I felt like I had to go to Ferguson to stand with the people who were standing up to everything the system could bring down on them and to stand with them in the fight for justice for Michael Brown. So that's right. what brought me down. Right. So um, I think many people, not, of course, not you or I <laughs> and a lot of people we know, but many people, I think, were shocked at the rapid and um, overwhelming response to the protests by the police state, by all of those means that you um, described. We saw some of it, of course, at some of the Occupy uh, crackdowns, the police state crackdowns on some of the Occupy movements around the country. But this really got uh, a lot of... Um, attention and I think first of all we are so sorry that another um, young person of color was murdered by by the cops and it seems like it's increasing that's a, a, a thing that is on the increase but um, the general uh, shock and, and disbelief of the militarization of the police forces is I'm gratified to see that there's a dialogue about it now. Yeah, because this is a real important development. These police forces have been getting this kind of weaponry from the federal government. It's actually weaponry that has been used around the world when people are rising up against U.S. domination. But then they're, set, they're passing it off to the police departments here. And when people took to the street in Ferguson to protest, it was like a military occupation being carried out. And when you look at it, it was both to send a message of intimidation, because I remember this one scene of one young guy with his hands up, and the hands up is a sign here, mm -hmm. a symbol of what people do, because Michael, no of the eyewitnesses said that Michael Brown had his hands up saying, don't shoot, when he was shot. Right. So what people do in the protest is they put their hands up and go, hands up, don't shoot. So there was this one lone guy with his hands up and about 12 cops in camouflage. And it struck me like camouflage has a particular purpose. Camouflage uniforms have a particular purpose. Mm -hmm. You go into the forest and you blend in. So why are you wearing camouflage in the middle of the town in the United States, except to send a message that we are serious, we're a militarized unit here, and you are the enemy, and you better watch it because we'll unleash this, this weaponry on, on you, which they've been doing. They did it for almost every night for a week here, but people refuse to back down. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing is that they have put police forces around the country in a position to unleash this military might to crush people, 
That was the point to it. And I, I'm pretty sure that they were thinking the people in Ferguson aren't the only ones who are dealing with police brutality and police murder. And rather than saying, okay, how do we stop the police brutality and police murder? The authorities were like, how do we stop the resistance to police brutality and police murder before it encourages others to step out and to resist and to resist in the ways that the people in Ferguson were resisting, which were very determined, you know, and uh, very defiant. And I think that scared them because that kind of defiance spreading around the country would be a problem for their system. Then the other thing that they did is they've been running these charges of outside agitators. And, you right. know, I'm 66 years old, so <laughs> I, my experience goes back to the early 1960s. Uh-huh. And that was the same charge that Bull Connor used against the freedom movement in uh, Birmingham, Alabama in the early 1960s. George Wallace did the same thing. All of those Southern segregationists were like outside agitators have come in and riled up the responsible Negroes here in my area, as if to say people who are suffering could never come to their on their own to the conclusion that they refuse to accept this anymore and stand up to do something about it, which is exactly what happened here in Ferguson, because if people here had not stood up, I may never have heard of Michael Brown in New York City. I was there working on the murder of Eric Garner, building protests around that, when I heard of Michael Brown's murder, but I heard of it because people took to the street. So it certainly wasn't a case that outside agitators came and riled people up in Ferguson. But one thing that they were going at is that they don't want the people in Ferguson, and especially those who were most defiant, to begin to connect with organization that is working on these questions, and especially revolutionary organizations. So I think that was part of their thing of talking about outside agitators, trying to make divisions between people here in Ferguson standing up and others who were coming from around the country and bringing a sense of nationwide resistance and a sense of a revolutionary approach. Revolution is the way out of this. So that's something that I think they're going at. And, you know, we're working from the other end to connect with people. We had a meeting today. A few dozen people came to it. We talked about why did I come to Ferguson? Why did the revolutionaries come? Uh Why did people come working on the October month of resistance to mass incarceration that Cornell West and I have called? For, and why do people here in Ferguson need to become part of a nationwide movement of resistance to all this abuse that the criminal injustice system brings down on them? Well, um, right. Talk about the the predictable response of the police state to try to demonize uh, Michael Brown and to really blame the victim as if anything they uh, they could accuse him of justified uh, murdering an unarmed person in the middle of the street with his hands up, you know, saying, don't shoot. Yeah, that's a very important point, Cindy, because when the killing happened, when they murdered him, the authorities then said, well, we have to do this investigation and we can't release any information until the investigation was over. And the point to that was to draw it out to hope people would move on and stop protesting and to lay the basis for a cover-up. But then in the face of the protest, they finally had to start dribbling out some information. So they released the name of the cop who had killed Michael Brown six days after it happened. But at the same time, they were released a video that purports to show Michael Brown shoplifting some cigars from a store minutes before he was killed. And the people have raised a lot of questions about whether that actually happened, did it happen right before the killing, but that's really not the question because you got right to it in terms of how do you justify shooting an unarmed man who was running away. Because even in a police story that has been leaked, because they haven't publicly released it, but someone leaked it, 
Michael Brown was running from the cop, even in the cop story. So if the guy, if Michael Brown is running away from the cop, why is the cop shooting at him and shooting him? But they used that video to say, well, he was a criminal anyway. Right. And even if it was exactly true, even if the cop knew about it, why do you shoot somebody over a box of cigars? That's what that came down to. And they're saying that we're going to criminalize you and demonize you, and then that justifies anything that we do to you. And this is a maneuver that they go through in these police killings, you know, all across the country. It's like there's a playbook that they work by. Mm -hmm. You kill somebody, it gets revealed that the person was, you know, unarmed, they weren't doing anything wrong. Well, then you have to portray them as a criminal to justify having killed them. And that's very much what's going down here in Ferguson. And people are not buying it. That's not going to, you know, I mean, there, there's a section of people that's buying it. Let right. me take that back. Uh-huh. Because there are people who are raising money right. for the police officer. Um, in fact, more money has been raised for him than has been raised for the family of Michael Brown. So some people are buying it, but those are people who feel that the author- whatever the authorities have to say is correct. But there are a lot of other people, especially here in Ferguson, who really have no trust for the authorities. The demands that people have raised, first off, the obvious one, indict and arrest the killer cop. But they've also raised firing of the police chief Mm-hmm. Chief Jackson, because this is a police chief, a police department that has a history of decades of dealing abuse to black people in particular. And it's in an area, the uh, Ferguson is like two thirds black, but the police department is 90 percent white. Right. And some of the activity that they've been involved in. I mean, I've been dealing with this for a long time. I've been dealing with these kinds of questions for decades. Some of it even surprises me because they pulled the guy over in a traffic stop, which happens here all the time, took him into custody because his last name fit the last name of someone they were looking for. His first name didn't, but his last name did. Right. They took him into custody. Mm -hmm. He protested being taken in. So they beat him nearly senseless. His blood was all over the place. And then they found out, oh, yeah, we can't pin this on him. He wasn't the guy, Uh, which is what he was saying all along. But now they've beaten him. So then they charged him with destroying government property. And the destruction of government property was that his blood had soiled the police officer's uniforms as they beat him. Oh, my God. And they literally (laughs) charged him with that and took it into the court system. Wow. And we're going to go ahead with it, but the judge threw it out. Wow. I mean, and this is what this police mm-hmm. department does. Nobody in the police department, nobody in the prosecutor's office tossed that out. None of these cops who beat this guy, because how did his blood get on you? You know, you beat, you beat him nearly senseless and splattered his blood everywhere. But no cops were punished for that. And the guy's civil suit even got thrown out. I mean, that's how bad things have been in this area. And it's that kind of experience that has led people to stand up and resist and to be defiant in the way that they have. Well, Carl, how, what is going on there on the ground right now? On the ground right now, um, the level of protests have dipped some. And, I mean, we're going to be going out later on. People are still out, though, because last night around midnight, there was a march from the area where Michael Brown was killed to the uh, police department. So people are out, and nighttime is the right time here, Mm -hmm. in part because it's very hot. Like, it was 100 degrees today, so people wait for the sun to go down Mm -hmm. and it to cool off. But also some of the people, just it just feels right to them to go out at night and to protest. So we're going to be going out again tonight and tomorrow. And then also the funeral is going to be on Monday. 
And I mean, that's going to be a time to pay last respects to Michael Brown. And I'm expecting thousands of people will come out to do that. Uh, the one other thing that I, I need to say about this is that the police have really been enacting uh, very tight and just vicious clampdown. I mean, and it's not just the tear gas, the rubber bullets, the sound cannons, National Guard mobilizations, although that is bad enough, the armored personnel carriers. I mean, you may have heard, or your your listeners may have heard about the cop who got suspended for taking out his weapon, pointing it at protesters, and saying, I'm going to effing kill you right. again and again. Well, this cop is not alone in doing that. Cops have been pointing guns at grandmothers, at three-year-olds, threatening to kill people. This has been going on endlessly up until about yesterday. I didn't hear of any such incidents yesterday, but up until yesterday, these incidents were going on repeatedly. And uh, it's even gotten down to the level where they tell you how fast you have to walk when you're protesting. Uh -huh. Because you can't stand still and congregate in right. protest in, right. in the protest area. You have to walk. And they have threatened people with arrest and carried out arrests because people were walking too slow. Wow. I mean, that's how intense it is here. And that's what's been driving this. So the story that, you know, there's a certain rowdy, militant, or criminal element, and they're the problem, is really upside down. The problem from the very beginning has been the police and their violence, you know, and the way that they are just harassing and going after people. And that has been what people have been responding to. And their response has been very important because, like I said, no one would know who Michael Brown was if they hadn't done that. But because they did it, not only around the country, but around the world, because when the tear gas, the first night the tear gas was thrown here in Ferguson, people in Gaza began to tweet to the people in Ferguson uh -huh. with instructions on how to deal with tear gas. Right, right. There's been demonstrations in countries like Turkey that were about Gaza and Ferguson, you know, and that's how much the resistance of people here in Ferguson has reached out to people around the world and drawn their attention and their support. Um, somebody made a point today that... You know, we saw tear gas, we saw um, police state violence uh, during the anti-Vietnam War protests, but most of the time it was the National Guard. And now it's actually local police departments that have that kind of firepower and that kind of weaponry and, um, to, you know, those tools of violent oppression and so my question my question is do is the military militarization of the police forces is that an issue that is being discussed or is it mostly about you know rightly about getting justice for Michael Brown and his family well, both of them are being discussed. I mean, people are out for justice, but they have noticed the way the police came back at them. And it is a thing of, like, some people are posing, you're coming at us like we were a foreign country that you were occupying. Right. <laughs> why, why is it that the police have this kind of weaponry? And, and why are they using it against the citizens of the country? You know, and this is a training ground on one level for both sides, a training ground for the police in utilizing this weaponry and getting in position to deal with uprisings that will develop in this country. But it's also a training ground for the people in terms of how do you continue resistance in the face of this. And the young people of Ferguson, far from being a problem, 
with their defiance and determination are actually pointing the way for some people because I remember uh, I got arrested Monday night um, pretty much for standing with the defiant people Mm -hmm. of Ferguson. Wow. That was both the message I was taking out there and it's a message that uh, I want to direct people to a website. That's uh, revcom.us. That's R-E-V-C-O-M dot us, which has a whole lot of coverage of what's been going on here in Ferguson from the very beginning. And there's a statement there, we stand with the defiant ones, which I really encourage people to read. And I was taking the message from that out to the protests, and there were these people who had dubbed themselves as the keepers of peace and calm in the protest who were trying to keep me from delivering that, speaking to people, because they were like, we don't want to get the youth riled up. (laughs) <laughs> and I was kind of like, okay, why don't you guys try to keep the police from being wild? Right. Up? Because in the middle of what was a fairly peaceful and calm protest, the police would repeatedly drive an armored personnel carrier into the middle of it, and squads of officers in camouflage would jump out and point their guns at people. Uh-huh. And then they get back in the armored personnel carrier and go back. And it's kind of like, well, what are they doing that for? And, you know, why are you stopping me from delivering a political message? But it's okay for them to do that. And then in the midst of it, uh, the police begin to target people for arrest. And my arrest and Joey Johnson's arrest was clearly a targeted thing because at that point we were actually on the sidewalk and the cops came into the crowd and grabbed us and we found out later they did that with a number of other people because they arrested 78 people that night that was like the the height of the mass arrest last monday but it was that kind of targeted thing and like i said earlier there was a question there was fear on the part of the authorities of the defiant people in ferguson but also the potential for revolutionary communists connecting with those defiant people and bringing to them a sense that things don't have to be this way, that we can change all of this through revolution and bringing to them a movement for revolution that they could connect with. And that was something that they definitely didn't want to see go down. Well, I don't know. Actually, the story of my arrest is also up on Revcom. Okay, I'll, I'll put that link. Immediately after. Yeah, I'll put that link um, also for people to go to. You know, I always say, and I've been involved in many peaceful protests that have been d- disrupted and, um, you know, by the cops. And I always say, who, who, which side were the ones that came dressed for a riot? <laughs> yeah. You know, <laughs> so it's like, are you guys throwing a riot here? But it's just, uh, it's amazing that, that uh, you know, most of the people who are, are counseling that, like you said, um, you know, come from, even though uh, many of them might be good-hearted people, a lot of times they come from a, a position of privilege. And, the, you know, they want the police state violence to stop but they don't want it to stop at the cost of maybe some of their personal comfort. Yeah, and they really end up, ultimately, they can end up lining up with the police are trying to suppress you. Right. Because I had to tweet out at, the, at some of them, you guys are calling peace and calm. How does peace and calm advance the cause of justice for Michael Brown? You know, because that, that's exactly it. The police, and some of them were actually openly working with the police. It mm-hmm. wasn't just that they ended up on that side against their own better judgment. Some of them actually had meetings with the police, wanted to work with the police, uh-huh. and <laughs> right. wanted to help them maintain order. And really, when you look at the police and the governor and the mayor and all of them, it's clear why they're calling for peace. They're calling for peace because they want to keep the status quo in effect. And it's being challenged by people defiantly protesting. 
These well, people who anoint themselves as mm-hmm. peace police, well, why are you guys calling for peace? Are you calling for peace for the same reasons? And if your reasons are different, you gotta you gotta figure out. You gotta take a stand. Which side are you on? Are you on the side of the authorities maintaining the status quo, or the people who want to change the status quo? Are you on the side of the oppressed or the oppressors? Yeah, so that's exactly it. The, I know the images and the news have out of there to some of us have been super inspiring. I wish I could have gone down there, um, but I'm glad you're there to bear witness. And people, like you said, could get more information at revcom, R-E-V-C-O-M dot U-S. And we will, on our newsletter, um, you know, give that link also. And Carl, hopefully um, after, you know, you're finished uh, with this. And I want to ask also what's next for that uh, movement in Ferguson. But you can come back on and talk about your uh, month of, um, you know, action against mass incarceration. Yeah, against mass incarceration because that's also very important and so intimately linked with what we've been talking about today. But what's next? Um, what What's next for the movement? in Ferguson, besides the, the funeral for Michael Brown on Monday. And, you know, my heart, my heart is so with that family. I met the mother of Andy Lopez uh, a, about a week or so after he was murdered by, um, by Eric Gellhaus in, in Santa Rosa. And I, I've been there, Carl. I know how that is. So we have to also remember that... This is a, a large issue. It's, you know, the issue of the war at home, the war abroad, empire. But there is a mother and a family that's also involved. Yes, no, that, that's very real. And I have met and worked with a number of family members of police murder victims. And uh, uh, so I, I, I feel what you're saying, and I know that too. Well, in terms of what's next... This struggle has to continue here because, like I said earlier, the cop who carried out the murder, Darren Wilson, has still not been indicted or arrested. The police chief is still in place, presiding over continued brutality against people here in Ferguson. And the investigation is proceeding like a cover-up. I mean, they're saying now that they will not come back with any decision on indictment from the grand jury until sometime in October. And so far, everything that they have done seems geared at justifying Michael Brown's murder from the release of the video, from leaking the cop's story to try to justify what he did. So the struggle has to continue, not necessarily in the same forms, not necessarily people demonstrating in large numbers every night, although so far there have been significant numbers of people in the street every night, but it needs to continue. And, uh, you know, people are down here. We issued a call for people to come to Ferguson this weekend. Dozens of people have responded to it, and they're going to be going out as soon as the sun goes down and it cools off a bit. And this kind of activity needs to go on. People need to keep their eyes on Ferguson. They need to act in solidarity with people in Ferguson. And we're working on making connections between people in Ferguson and people from other parts of the country. Because uh, several family members of police murder victims came down from Chicago, some came from Atlanta, some have come from New York. Some have come from California. We want to connect those with the family here. We want to connect just people who came down to be in solidarity with the struggle, connect them to the people fighting here, so that there is a stronger sense of nationwide movement of resistance. And uh, I would... My thinking is there's no plans developed yet, but there is going to be another upsurge here in Ferguson in October, one way or the other. Because even if there is an indictment, an indictment of a killer cop is a step towards justice, but it ain't justice itself, because then there's a trial, and 
there's been a lot of experience of prosecutors forgetting how to prosecute right. when the defendant is a killer cop. So there's going to be a need for people to struggle all the way through around justice. And I'm just from having met with people, marched with people, gone to jail with people down here, there are a lot of people who are determined to make that happen. And we're going to do everything we can to help in that struggle. Well, Carl Dix, thank you so much for coming on Cindy Sheehan Soapbox for this special report on what's happening in Ferguson, Ferguson, Missouri. And thank you for being there. And of course, please keep us posted with anything that um, I know. I know you do it on Revcom.us, but if you know, let us know if there's anything um, that we need to get out in a in a super duper hurry. And we can follow you okay. on Twitter. Oh yeah. Um... Let's see, at Carl underscore Dix, and that's C-A-R-L underscore D-I-X. Uh, I try to keep my Twitter feed active so that uh, people know what I'm involved in, what I'm about, and what's going on. Uh, I wasn't able to keep it active Monday night when they arrested me. Right. <laughs> but, uh, I know about that. <laughs> I got back to it Tuesday when I got out of jail. Why won't they let us keep our, our phones and stuff in jail so we can update everybody about what's going on? I just don't get it. So, um, Carl, is there anything you'd like to add? Well, I already gave the one the, rev, the revcom.us website. I also want to put out the Stop Mass Incarceration Network website, which is stopmassincarceration.net. Stop Mass Incarceration, all one word, dot N-E-T. And I want to give you give your listeners that one because that's where you can find out you can see the vision for the month of of resistance to mass incarceration in October, the plans. You can download materials and get involved. Okay, well, let us know when you in a couple of weeks when um, you'd like to come on and talk more about that. Okay. Okay, Carl. Well, thank right. you so much for like I said for your time and for being there. And hopefully we'll talk soon. And stay safe and give our solidarity to all the comrades there. I will do that. And thank you for having me on, Sydney. Thank you, Carl. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.